Thank you, Martin. I'll just uh, share my screen. Um, I need to say uh, it is all teamwork. So uh, uh, we work together on a daily basis. I, I need to pass this credit also to you and to all my other colleagues in, uh, in, um, in Rotterdam and in the Netherlands. Uh, can you see my screen? I can't hear you. Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. And I should be in a presenter mode, mode right now. So hello, everyone. Uh, I have to say enjoying the meeting so far very much. And I'm very grateful for the wonderful panel discussion that we had because it's actually touched on quite some of the points that uh, I have prepared for you today. So my talk today is going to be uh, on some general considerations for the quality collection on biobanking of urinary EVs. Uh, I'll show you a practical example of how you organize the collection of biobanking for the Dutch multi-center research project. And also we'll give you a quick pick of our new quick reference card, uh, which focuses on storage of urinary EVs. Okay, let's start. So um, the other day when I was preparing for the meeting, uh, I decided to uh, do a quick PubMed search and uh, to check uh, for the new literature on urinary EV biobanking after all the position paper was published uh, more than a year ago already. But I have to admit the result was actually rather disappointing. Uh, it returned only 12 publications when I Googled XSLR, when I searched in PubMed XSLR vesicles, urine, urinary, and biobank. And what was even more disappointing was that in that list, one was a review, one was the position paper, and the other 10 articles were actually focusing uh, on uh, rather on the cargo on the EVs rather than on the um, biobanking procedures and, and then standards of that. Um, so, in fact, this is also identified as a roadblock, and this is uh, uh, the, one of the methodological gaps that we touched on in the position paper, as you can see on this illustration here. Um, and it is reflected by the insufficient protocol standardization and incomplete, incomplete reporting of clinical and experimental sample parameters. The majority of the published work starts somewhere um, where the arrow, green arrow is pointing uh, around the EU EV isolation. Um, and the majority of work actually describes the effect of different isolation protocols, while patient selection, sample collection, and storage are considered pre analytical steps in uh, um, extracellular vesicles research. And if you ask uh, yourself why, uh, frankly, um, these steps are often seen as uh, less scientifically sexy, let me put it that way, and not so rewarding in terms of impact on your publication record, and we all know the uh, motto is publish or perish. Nevertheless, uh, you can imagine that this directly influences research outcomes and causes ambiguity and low reproducibility of published uh, findings. And as we are trying actually to uh, point out here, it hinders the clinical translation and the utilization of, your, of EV findings in the clinical practice. So we do a lot of research, but actually very little of it is in the clinic yet. Um, so that's why I would like to take a close look to the today a little bit of the pre-analytical steps and the critical factors that affect them and the final results uh, uh, and the, the influence they have on the final results. If you hear, if you look at here the workflow we have, the patient we start always with the patients or the healthy volunteers, depending on the study design, um, and factors that are influence that that have influence in this uh, are the treatments the patients are undergoing, uh, are there any known comorbidities, and also not to forget, uh, is there any multi cell center variation in the patient population, and by this I mean. You have to realize if you have an academic center that is only patients with uh, a specific um, um, uh, more rare types of, of tumors or, or more complex clinical cases, then the population of your biobank will be slightly biased, or maybe not that slightly, to, uh, compared to uh, a more general patient population that is usually uh, seen in a periphery hospital. In the next step in the collection of the transport, 
the many things we uh, often mention, but somehow tend to ignore when we report and when you prepare our publications. Um, uh, but you should consider when you're preparing to, to start a biobanking uh, uh, bio bank, uh, such as the time to collect a large, large enough cohort, uh, as strange as it may sound with the frequency of prostate cancer, uh, you may actually end up with not enough time to collect to collect sufficient patients, particularly if you're looking at uh, more severe uh, uh, disease stages and then higher glycans are. Another factor is the physical examination prior to collection. Uh, is there a digital rectal examination informed, for example, or not? The time of collection of urine, the dedicated collection device, is it a certified container that you're using? Yes or no? The sample type. Uh, and the uh, uh, ability of the patient to actually collect it properly. Then, of course, we have the process and the storage, the sample centrifugation uh, and freezing that can affect uh, uh, the steps and the capacity of the clinical lab, uh, which has to process other samples, not just only those that are in importance for your particular uh, biobank. The use of aliquots. And of course, on the last place, but absolutely not the least important, is the cost of centralized biobanking with dedicated freezer storage space and a specified containers, which can go up quite a lot. In addition to that, there are several unknown factors that you cannot really control, but should consider and keep in mind uh, and include as variables in your study. And that's what include the individual's medical history, which is not always known, particularly in archive uh, collections, the non-compliance, the logistic parts, like, for example, the insufficient or incomplete database or storage facilities, and the human error, which is always uh, there, uh, which can result in inconsistent or incomplete documentation and reporting. So altogether, this would influence your processing uh, reporting results. And you have to consider those. And luckily, there are several resources available. And my screen is not OK. So there are several resources available that can help you guide through uh, um, all of this. There are the position papers of myself and uh, also on the specifically the one on the urinary EVs. There are nowadays also standard operating procedures for the collection and storage of urine and blood that are actually also dedicated to EVs. I'll tell you a little bit later about our quick reference card. Um, there are guidelines on reproducibility and reporting standards. Uh, most of you know, actually all of you should know about EV track, but there are also some literature about it. And not on the last place, the open access uh, repositories available um, out there. So I promise to uh, give you a practical example, which is coming from a Dutch collaborative consortium project that is funded by the Dutch Cancer Society. Uh, and it's a project that uh, uh, is called IMPROVE. Uh, IMPROVE stands for Innovative Measures and Markers for Prostate Cancer Diagnosis and Prognosis using uh, extracellular vesicles. Um, and the goal of uh, the consortium was to develop in the techniques and protocols for the detection and quantitation of urinary EVs uh, and their protein and RNA cargo. I was particularly focused on the RNA cargo, as probably some of you know. Uh, and then last but not least, to translate the findings into clinical practice via pre-validation trials. So during the entire project, we have been biobanking um, material to be able to perform the validation uh, step on the end. So here is the biobanking, uh, and I'm showing a step, and I'm showing you the uh, first page of our urinary collection storage protocol. And if you look at the date of preparation, you will see we started with this document in 2016 and took uh, actually um, practically one year before we ended up with a complete uh, protocol. And you'll see in a moment why. What I need to say about biobanking, the two important uh, uh, factors, so the collection parameters, uh, particularly if you're going to do a multi-center study, you need to have a uniform collection protocol, uh, one. And the second thing is the clinical data and experimental measurements. What are you going to collect? How are you going to collect what data? And how are you going to sto sto store this and uh, uh, maintain it um, in, in um, 
privacy also and, and a confined uh, confound matter. So I need to mention we collected over 50 different sample parameters here and uh, maybe it's a funny picture on the side, but it's actually very true. It's better to collect uh, more, all the information that you can then end up with a missing factor on the end of your study. Uh, just to give you a quick peek into our urine collection uh, and storage protocol, um, we start, for example, with instructions for physicians for urine collection, uh, including the number of strokes that they need to perform during the digital rect rectal examination. And then in red are very specific uh, uh, notes that are uh, actually dedicated to the uh, extracellular vesicle part of the research. Another important thing is uh, it also contains uh, information on the urine collection, and this isn't about the patient. For example, some patients are old or cannot uh, um, uh, maintain or control the urine stream properly. So there is specific instructions into the protocol how to handle that particular part. We do have also priority rules in case of not enough urine is collected, which can also happen which samples, uh, which aliquots should be taken, what volume, which are the priority and how to handle those. And then on the end, there's also information that uh, a list of the information uh, notes that should be recorded on the, uh, in, the, in the worksheet. This is the minimal information of, of the study, actually in fact, and the standardized uh, worksheet uh, that, that goes along with uh, uh, the barcode that uh, is, should be identical with the collection devices. So I need to mention, we didn't develop this completely alone. This was actually co-evolved, this evolved together with a protocol that was put together by the European Association of Urology. And nowadays, uh, it's actually uploaded at the uh, website of the National Cancer Institute under the Biospecimen Research Database. And you can find not particularly the improv protocol, but the protocol, which is a very similar to that, um, uh, which is actually uh, presented as a standard operation uh, procedure for collection of urine after DRE. And there's another one, which is also for samples that they collected uh, without the DRE. Um, next is the biobank. So we choose uh, to go for a caster for the electronic database capture. Um, uh, it's uh, one of the reasons to go for this specific one was that uh, all, three multi all three academics and medical center were using the same system and uh, were familiar with, uh, with, with, with its uh, layout. It's a big advantage also because uh, you can easily transfer data from the one center to the other without the need to uh, go through different uh, database formats uh, and export and import uh, uh, changes, which can add a different uh, level of uh, uh, ambiguity or, or can cause uh, uh, unwanted errors. So uh, just to Quick screenshots from what the database looks like. Uh, as you can see, there is uh, information on the study. If you go per patient, you can have the general patient info, which is anonymized, the different medical measurements, uh, clinical pathological measurements, and also you can keep in all your experimental measurements, uh, depending of what your particular study is. Uh, what you're seeing here is, for example, the number of EVs in the certain volume of urine and the different levels of uh, CD markers that were measured. Um, so when you have set up your study in that way, that would allow you, and in this case allowed us to perform several quality control checks during the process of sample collection and on the end of it as well. And what you see on the left side of my screen is the collected samples. Uh, as you can see, we did collect uh, 500 samples, which was our goal. But if you look at the, for example, the PCA positive samples and the high gleason score groups, you see that they're actually rather underrepresented. So on the end, we were not about at the right statistical power level where you we uh, wanted to end up to, uh, to be able to identify a prognostic biomarker. The, the, the set was sufficient for identification of diagnostic. Uh, a biomarker, but not for a prognostic one. So this is something you should actually try to estimate on the beginning of the study, if possible. Are you going to have enough time and enough centra to collect the number of samples you actually need? 
the graph shows the comparison between the different um, academic centra. So we were looking for um, hidden biases, luckily in our case, uh, maybe also thanks to the protocol and the time we spent in it, uh, we had quite a uniform cohort. Um, and uh, we could perform uh, our monitoring also during the, the collection. Um, next to that, I think I missed, oh, okay. Next to that, we could control also clinical pathological characteristics and biofluid uh, cohort characteristics, um, which are all relevant. And actually what we we're looking here for, what we were looking for here was rather to see if the cohort that we're collecting has the typical clinical pathological characteristics and also biofluid characteristics. And one inter interesting observation that we saw was that, for example, that the urinary PSA uh, goes down with the uh, increase of uh, disease stage aggressiveness and the other way around goes up in uh, serum PSA uh, during the same uh, uh, disease progression, while the prostate volume, for example, stays the same. And this is more or less what you want to see. The, is, uh, is your cohort actually corresponding to your expectations? A um, few more things uh, to touch on here um, to, and to consider is that uh, how do you define your targets? So this is good to think of before you actually start. You even are you going to do a biomarker discovery study or are you going to do a biomarker validation study? In this case, it was a validation study. So the design was uh um take taking that into consideration it is important to define and optimize your methodology um and to perform it in uh, reiteration steps to answer the specific questions before you actually perform the actual validation so this could be um the first question is, uh, do we have the detection power uh, what are the detection limits of the technology that we are testing um, next thing is, can we actually see a diagnostic performance in the cohort uh, from and which biomarkers or candidate biomarkers should have that diagnostic performance? And then on the end, when you have set this up, the actual validation uh, can be done in relatively short time and without uh, too much um, uh, unexpected surprises. So just to give you a quick um, uh, uh, show overview of the results, this is actually what came out from our study from all the 11 biomarkers that you were looking uh, at, the RNA biomarkers. We found uh, actually only two that were working. We had to normalize the urinary PSA. Um, and uh, in a way, this was uh, uh, positive results. But again, when you're planning a biomarker discovery and validation study, keep in mind you may lose initially promising biomarker candidates, and you may or may not, you may end up with such that may or may not outperform the existing ones. And here I'm showing you the comparison with uh, the Prohenza PCA3. Uh, biomarker, which was available at the beginning of the study, but the select MDX graph was not. So somewhere halfway, we had to deal all of a sudden with another uh, competitive uh, biomarker. So um, this is the example that I wanted to give you. And uh, uh, while we are still crunching and collecting the data, we wanted to share uh, a lot of our experience we gained during the process. Uh, so we uh, practically the entire team joined the um, urine task force and uh, several of us are part of the work group on storage uh, that, that belongs to the urine task force. And in the last year we developed the quick reference card uh, for urine and urinary EVs. Um, the card is a product of the International Storage Working Group, as I mentioned, and it's currently in print in draft. I'm here. It is. Um, we expecting it to be published in the coming weeks, so keep uh, your eye open uh, to that. And uh, what's important is that it overall it summarizes the current expert consensus as it was published in the position paper, but it's an uh, A4 format, so you can just really print it out and laminate it and use it in your lab. Um, uh, and the, 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 um, 
what it shows is actually the best storage practices for urine and urinary EV is prioritizing on evidence level, but also on reporting level. So uh, when you're wondering what should I include in my publication, you can always take a look at here. What I'd like to stress out is that this is not a protocol, but a guideline, which means that it's meant to assist you during your project design and uh, execution. And you should not really take it blindly as a, as a protocol because that would be really dependent on your specific question and your specific view bank design. There is one more thing that is uh, under construction in the group at the moment. So we are working on um, a storage um, of urinary EV framework where we try to identify the key storage factors that would affect uh, the urinary EV cargo. And we hope to um, be able to finalize this before the uh, end of the year. So uh, to summarize uh, the entire talk, how to deal with known and unknown variab variables in urinary EV storage. Um, well, first of all, uh, make an inventory of all known variables and order them of expected impact before you start. Uh, so prepare your study, talk with colleagues, uh, check the literature, what's available out there. Test different variables for their effect. Uh, so perform small pilot studies, uh, publish on those, draw conclusions that you can use for your final design, standardize as many high impact variables as possible. So use SOPs or develop your own if there's no existing ones. Keep a record of the methods and the SOPs uh, deviations. Um, in Europe, data management is becoming a really important part of scientific research. So develop your data management protocols, preferably before you start the study. Reinterpret, learn, and adapt. Uh, so reiterate and use several rounds. Don't go for one big uh, uh, test on the end. And finally, accept that you will never be able to control all known variables, certainly the unknown variables and the EV technology advancements that may change the impact of the different variables. So you try to be at the state of the art or the state of the art yourself. So with this, I'd like to uh, conclude uh, with a phrase that is the motto of our department. And that is that the best care starts with the best uh, research. But don't forget, um, when you are on the journey of science discovery, do not forget to have fun and to explore the new paths. And here I would like to thank to all my colleagues from uh, Erasmus uh, and from the Netherlands, the different universities that participated in the study, the Urine Task Force, and the organizers of the meeting today, as well as all my colleagues from the Urine Storage Workgroup. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Elena, for this uh, excellent talk on a very important topic. Um, there are some questions in the chat, um, so I will uh, I will read out uh, those questions so that uh, hopefully you can answer at least some of them. Um, so a, a question from Anna Marquez. Um, uh, so why did you normalize the RNA expression with the urinary PSA? Why was that necessary? Okay, great question. Um, so um, I showed you on the slide what we realized while um, monitoring the collection of the samples is that um, um, urinary PSA, uh, unlike a serum PSA, decreases with the increase of the Gleason score um, in the sample in the patient population, uh, which means that um, the biology behind this is slightly different than what we expect. And then urine PSA usually comes free in the, pro, in the, in the urine, uh, either during the DRE procedure when the prostate is massaged or the, during the little bit of leakage that normally occurs. Uh, so you can real, uh, imagine if the prostate volume is the same as you observed in this case, and that there's no difference between the studies, you cannot contribute the increase of urinary PSA to benign prostate hyperplasia or to other conditions. And the only thing that's left there to think of is the anatomy of the prostate anatomy of the tumor as they're changing during the cancer progression. So in fact, the urinary PSA becomes in our eyes a, a surrogate measurement for how much prostate fluid is actually ending up in urine. 
So if you just take the general urine concentration or the general urine volume that is collected and try to uh, go to the normalize to that, like or, or to creatinine in this case, you may actually be eliminating uh, your variables as the amount of urine of um, prostate fluid that ended up in urine would be different, particularly and less, particularly in the high um, high volume uh, high. High, uh, high stage disease, so in aggressive disease and high glycine score. Yeah, perfect. perfect. I have uh, two very similar questions from uh, Michael Decker and uh, Nishan Sharma. Um, uh, these are questions about uh, did you try different preservatives for the urine uh, in storage or um, the which is the best way of store to, to store the extracellular vesicle samples? Which buffer do you need to okay. use for long term storage? So, um, we did not use preservatives uh, because um, I can again stress this study started quite some time ago, uh, but we did include in our uh, um, collection protocol that uh, all the samples should be processed by the clinical lab within four hours after collection. Um, which actually uh, was one of the reasons why the collection time was a little bit uh, actually the collection was quite slow at the beginning because the clinical lab had to adapt to the protocol that we uh, presented to them and they were not able to process sufficient amount of samples uh, in parallel to other clinical samples that they were receiving so uh, we actually decided to go for uh, quick processing immediately uh, after or immediately okay. within four hours after collection and not so much by the addition of additives as such additives may actually influence also biological factors and uh, we would not know at that time what uh, what those factors would be yeah uh, there's time for one more question um so this is a question uh, from maya uh, the uh, co-host in this case um and so how would you re recommend the use of the uh, the the quick reference card so uh, how um, yeah, how do you see this? Yeah, well, um, nice question. Thank you, Maya. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about that, but uh, it is actually really meant to um, for the newcomers in the field, uh, one, to give them a quick idea what are the current, uh, um, what is the current uh, expert opinion on the topic? Um, what should they report? Uh, should they store at uh, minus 20 or minus 80? What should they not do? And then also when you're preparing a biobanking study, it uh, would be nice to take the card and, 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 and look through the different lines and see, am I, do, do I have all those parameters included in my SOP or am I missing something? You know, one thing that I'd like to mention here is our ambition. I don't know if you're going to uh, be able to realize it, but it is our ambition to be able to update that every so many years um, when new uh, knowledge appears there. So uh, hopefully this is version one, and then a few years from now, we would be <laughs> able to uh, publish version two if there is uh, major changes um, uh, or, or major unknown gaps uh, filled. Okay. With that, uh, I want to thank you very much, Elena, uh, for the presentation again and for answering the, the questions. There are a few questions left in the in the chat, so please can you uh, address those via the chat? That